let's say you have a boss who never tells you what they actually expect of you in the work. So they're not giving you feedback. They're not making it clear what your expectations are. And so you're constantly running this subtle anxiety of trying to hit a target that you can't see because you don't know what it is. And that can create a little T trauma. So it's slow. It's over time. It's something that we might otherwise overlook that we don't realize is having an impact on our nervous system and is creating some sort of patterning over time. Hi, I am Sophie Vaux, and this is the Rise and Play podcast. In the show, I sit down with influential thought leaders of the gaming industry to deconstruct how they create the best team and company cultures in order to create the best games. Every episode brings actionable insight to improve your leadership, self-awareness, and emotional management skills. Because becoming a better leader starts with becoming a better human. So, are you ready to unlock your full potential in life and business? Let's begin. So today I'm very excited to have with me a special guest, Sangia who has been my executive coach for now a year and a half and starting during my difficult times at Voodoo. So she has been following me when I was building the studio, also having new managements where I learned a lot about managing upwards, focusing on what I can control and how do I handle the things I don't control. So I learned a lot with her. And also I'm personally very excited to have her with me on the podcast to talk about another topic that is not so talked openly about trauma in leadership and with leaders. And that's also things we have discussed in our own one-on-one coaching sessions, looking in words for myself and trying to debunk, deconstruct certain patterns and habits I used to have that have origins that are much further than what I'm aware of today. That's why I wanted to invite Sangya today for a conversation to give a bit more context and share knowledge and even opening minds for people who have never heard about it. Hi, Sangya. Hi, Sophie. Before we start, please also share with our audience a bit your background and how you started with coaching, what have you done before and where you are today. Hi, Sophie, and thank you for having me here. I feel really honored to have been invited to be able to speak about this topic because, as you say, it can be quite taboo sometimes. A bit about my background, I started my career in the construction industry, not so much the hands-on physical building, but more the managing of the virtual design and construction of those projects. And through that period of time, I, one, was given an immense amount of responsibility at a very young age and was managing quite large budgets. And during that period, I made many, 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 many mistakes. Maybe every single management mistake that's in the book, I made all those mistakes. And somehow I still managed to survive, but I must admit that through that process, I entered my first burnout. And this is also where my journey with mental health began. After that, I then got into startups. So leaving that, having a burnout, sounds like a really great idea, right? Why not jump into the entrepreneurship deep end and then (laughs) learn how to start companies and run teams and do that whole thing? And there was a moment in time where I realized that was a really bad decision, that I actually shouldn't have been running the company I was running, working with the people I was working with, and living in Beijing, where I was far away from my loved ones and my family and my supporters and my mentors, because they were all back in San Francisco. And so when I left that company, I had not another burnout, but a schism in my concept of myself. And let's say who I thought I should be versus who I was coming to understand I actually am. And it was during that period of time that coaching naturally emerged. It's like my ego had been eradicated because I felt like I had completely and utterly failed. I felt like I didn't know what I wanted. I didn't know who I was. And so when other entrepreneurs were coming to me asking, how do I break into the China market? How do I find a co-founder? How do I build a successful company and do some of the things that you've done? I didn't have an answer for them. And so I started asking them questions in return. And this is where that natural coaching started to arise. And so this is where my coaching journey really began. And now it's been 
about 10 years, maybe even over 10 years now that I've been on this journey. Yeah. And thanks for giving the context of as well, how you started and I'm learning, you know, it's something I wanted to discuss with you and based on observation or even discuss with other leaders, especially in gaming. First, not everyone is open for coaching. So that's the first layer. And second is when we go to coaching, it's very practical, like I have a goal, I know my issues and I know my problems, you know, and I don't expect to discover new problems that are about other things that are from the past, my triggers, which are, I would say, at the edge of the therapy world. I think that's why it's rarely associated uh, this word of trauma and how they impact the way you lead, the way you act, and especially in moments of triggers and emotional moments. So let's take a moment first on here, the definition and uh, where you see its place in coaching conversation of what we call trauma. Thank you for that framing too, because I think it is important for us to understand that, first of all, this topic is not for the faint of heart. There is stigma around what trauma is and what it means and what role we have in our workplaces to be able to talk about it. So let's start by defining it. Trauma in really simple terms is a wound that stays open and vulnerable in our nervous system, mentally, physically, emotionally, and relationally. So it's something that happens to or around us that creates an experience inside of us where our system is so overwhelmed that it cannot complete that cycle or close that loop. Another expert that I love referring to, Gabor Mate, he says that trauma is not what happens to you, but it's what happens inside of you as a result of what happens to you. There might be two people who witness the same experience, and one person's nervous system will become overwhelmed, and there will be a trauma there, and the other person's nervous system will not, and there will not be a trauma there. There's another distinction that I like to make between big T trauma and little t trauma. Big T trauma, this is what most of us think of as trauma. It's witnessing someone being hurt, maybe being hit by a train, you know, horrific thing to happen. That's a big T trauma. It's also ourselves experiencing a violation, something that shouldn't happen to us, maybe being hit. So that could be a big T trauma. But then we also have little T traumas. And little T traumas, they're sneakier and they're harder to spot. But one might even say they're more common than the big T traumas. And so the little T ones, let's say just being yelled at, you were yelled at by someone. It could also show up as repeated small things over time. So I'll use a work example here. Let's say you have a boss who never tells you what they actually expect of you in the work. So they're not giving you feedback. They're not making it clear what your expectations are. And so you're constantly running this subtle anxiety of trying to hit a target that you can't see because you don't know what it is. And that can create a little T trauma. So it's slow. It's over time. It's something that we might otherwise overlook that we don't realize is having an impact on our nervous system and is creating some sort of patterning over time. Yeah, definitely. Maybe here to go in a concrete example of how you label it like patterns you've observed, how can they translate in a everyday working life or it could even be a blocker in something that you meant to do but cannot do because of this body reaction or nervous system that is triggered? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question. And I want to make it clear that by the nervous system, we also mean the brain. Mm. So when I say mental, what I mean is more thoughts. So it's not the thoughts, but it's the actual brain itself. There is plenty of research that has shown the effects of trauma on our brains and on our nervous system. So I just want to clarify that because I realized I didn't earlier. I'm going to go into an example that links into something else that I'd like to talk about today. So let's say that in someone's upbringing, they learned that the expression of emotions is bad or weak. Maybe they had a parent who was always overwhelmed by emotions and just couldn't function. So this parent was unable to do the things that the child needed them to do because they were constantly in their own experience, their inner world of what was happening for them. Then as this child grows up, they might develop the belief, again, unconsciously in themselves that emotions are weak and that if I have emotions, I'm not going to be able to meet my needs or function in the world as an adult. 
And this has probably served them well because they can keep cool and keep calm and everything's under control. And then they're not able to be with other people's emotions. So if they're leading a team and someone in the team is upset, then the pattern this leader might play out is one where they either belittle that person and they strongly are like, you're not allowed to be upset. Emotions are not allowed in this team, which by the way, I would highly recommend against. So just note that this is something that we do see or the moment they see the emotion arise, they need to exit and bolt. So they don't know how to be with it. So they might tend to avoid feedback conversations or any sort of conflict, anything that might create emotions or create discomfort. The team feels unsafe and like they also have to hide their emotions, which one might argue goes against human nature because we cannot actually control our emotions in the way that we might like to. Yes, and I can relate a lot to the anecdotes and experience, although they are not like a particular experience with archetypes, because I don't know if it's generational upbringing where emotions were not very well understood, especially in education of the previous generation. And so the place they could have in a family or in our environment being young is very different. And I have seen most of the time more underdeveloped than really mature as You try to repair it as an adult and through conversation like this or even through therapy. One personal on my end that I feel, of course, confident to talk about because I have experienced it was triggers or like body reaction, like feeling of uh, danger, especially in uh, the early years of my career. There was little acceptance to underperformance or uh, weakness, showing vulnerability, people being open enough to say, I'm a little lost or I don't know what to do, like feeling a little helpless. I could see myself in the past in a position of manager, being not very tolerant of it and being uncomfortable in the presence of it. I was focusing towards the other one and saying, okay, they have things not figured out for themselves. They are not strong like me. And like years later, when I hit the wall with a few more intense situations, I realized that it was a rejection of my own emotions to be in the similar state of asking for help, for example. I have been raised to rely on myself, like to be raised independent and not rely or even trust others. So I expect others to behave the same. It's like not very realistic and it's a, a very individualistic as well way of thinking. And if I started to question this way of seeing the world and being, then I was questioning my existence. So there was a threat to even reconsider it and seeing differently. I can recognize where I made mistakes, not having enough empathy to see where others are coming from and taking the openness, vulnerability as an invitation for me to be also open and more vulnerable. Just looking back and not feeling shameful about it was even really hard. So I couldn't even improve on this because I didn't want to look back. I was looking away instead of learning from those experiences and understanding where it was coming from, having, in that case, even empathy for my former self. And instead of blaming myself, having empathy for where it came from and being able to repair it and be a bit more whole. Hmm. Yeah. And I think that's a perfect example. It touches on so many different themes of the complexity of this topic. I think the first point that I want to make following up on your story is that the experiences that you had and the way that you were this past self, it's neither good nor bad. It's simply neutral, right? It simply is. And I think oftentimes we like to think trauma is bad. And the fact that I'm behaving in this way based on what has happened to me in the past is bad and I shouldn't do that and it's wrong. And actually to move around that, maybe one of the first mindset shifts that we want to invite is coming to understand that that reaction, it was actually adaptive. And adaptive means that it is pro-life. So we adopted this way of behavior because our bodies, our nervous systems needed to behave that way to protect ourselves so that we could move forward. So something in you said, okay, like I need to not express emotions, not show weakness. And that is protective. 
So we can find a place where we hold that neutrally. So we're not saying, oh, I was wrong or I was bad for thinking and behaving this way. Then we can move into just simply accepting it and then choosing new behaviors now or choosing interventions. And it might not be as simple as, oh, now that I am aware of this, it's gone. And I can just move forward and be a great leader who's easeful and unburdened. It's not always that simple. Sometimes it's, wow, I'm now aware of this. And acknowledging maybe I need some extra support. Maybe I'll look for a therapist. Maybe Mm -hmm. I'll look for someone to talk to who can work with me through this new discovery that I've made. So it's that acknowledgement that we can't do it alone. I wanted also to connect here with a moment where I realized this was going beyond me, where this way of functioning was not serving me anymore. And the thing is like we are evolving by nature. And especially during the time At Voodoo, when I was building the new studio, there was a lot of uncertainty around pandemic, staying at home. I could feel I was losing the sense of control. And of course, I couldn't have control fully on this direction and this vision during pandemic because a lot of things were fluid and I couldn't apply my ideal conditions for my ideal team. And that caused me a lot of stress where a lot of triggers and I could feel it in the body. Like I was in constant state of nervousness, stress, I I felt like completely helpless. So this is where I realized like, okay, maybe there are things that are beyond my understanding and I want to understand more where it's coming from. And I thankfully through some readings and books, I understood this could have different origins than what I'm aware of. And the other signal was also there was some resistance and rejection from the first team I was building. I was maybe too harsh, too pushy. And so at the same time, I wanted to control things and having a sense of security with their support. But I was acting in a way that didn't create fully the safety for people to be fully there and supportive. That was a moment of awareness that it was a must that I needed to talk to someone, explore, understand a bit more what was going on. Yeah. And the other thing I hear in your story, it's that realization that asking for support isn't a sign of weakness. It's actually a sign of strength because you have reached the extent of what you can do on your own. And now you're acknowledging that there's more that could be done with other support and other help. How is this conversation going as you discover and you uncover that there's something a bit deeper than just the facts? Yeah. I think the first thing is that I don't go here unless the client goes here. So something that's Mm -hmm. important to say in this work is that when my clients come to me, they come in with an idea of what are the leadership goals that they have? Like, how could they be a better leader? They don't come in with a concept of, oh, you know, I'm on the road to burnout. I'm noticing my emotions. I have uh, some weird relationship with them. Either they're overexpressed or underexpressed. You know, these aren't the topics that they'll come forward with. They're usually topics around, I want to be a better communicator. I want to be better at giving and receiving feedback. I want to know how to motivate my team. These are the topics that are brought forward. So in the nature of that and honoring that, In coaching, we don't go intentionally into the realm of therapy or these personal topics. What we do instead is we create what I call a permission field. And the permission field is the playground within which anything can happen in a coaching session. So it's allowing the client enough freedom, building enough trust that they naturally bring forth different topics or experiences, circumstances, vulnerabilities, and can be met in that permission field without feeling judged or wronged or shame. But if they do feel shame, that shame is also welcome. And I think that's one of the keys to that permission field is it's anything, any emotion they bring, it's all allowed. So then in therapy, the difference would be that a therapist might intentionally make certain interventions or ask probing questions that go deeper into these areas. And then they might offer advice or teachings or actions that one can take to move through whatever it is that they're experiencing in their past. In coaching, we wouldn't do that. We simply wouldn't. The extent to which that would reach is we allow whatever the client wants to talk about to be spoken about so they can share something highly traumatic. And in fact, many of my clients have shared that. They've shared things that like on the outside, one might judge as crazy and unfair and horrendous, right? But within the field of coaching, it's simply another piece of the human experience. 
and it's neutral and it's allowed and it's welcome. Right. But then if it sounds like it's a therapeutic topic, I'll actually say that I'll say, Hey, I think that you could benefit from speaking with a licensed professional. Sometimes I'll give recommendations, sometimes not. It just depends on the content and how severe it is. And then what we can do in coaching is beyond just simply the healing act of them being listened to and seen, we can talk about how this is affecting their leadership, like how they're seeing this crossover, what actions they want to take that will help them manage whatever it is that's arising. And it might look like reading a book. Right? It mm-hmm. might look like making sure they're getting at least eight hours of sleep. So again, these actions aren't always big things. They can be simple, important steps, foundational steps. We never intentionally go into trauma in the coaching sessions. However, over time, these topics and themes will naturally arise. The one thing that I do look out for that is important to say are signs of burnout. So I've actually worked now with four incidents where there was what I would call full clinical burnout, meaning a two-week vacation isn't going to cut it. Each of these individuals Mm -hmm. took at least six months off, which to someone in a leadership position sounds like an immense amount of time, but that also speaks to the severity of a real clinical burnout. And because of that, I have created some charts that I will show my clients that help them self map. Like, where do you think you might be within this experience of stress? And there is a category in that chart that I would call the burnout category, but it's not labeled as such. Mm -hmm. So it's helping clients also self identify and just notice, is this normal stress that I'm experiencing? Can I bounce back? Or have I somehow moved entirely beyond my ability to be within the breadth of healthy stress that we all experience? That's why intentionally today we use the word to have a common language, but maybe it might be exactly an origin with traumatic events, although it will not be the topic of a conversation might not be focused around it. So it could be have a lot of uh, prejudice with what we think of it. I think especially in position of leadership, there's a certain expectation image of society where we have to stay strong. We are a bit above the crowd. You know, we don't have any problems. It's not very popular as a leader to have (laughs) mental health issues or strong emotions, like having a trauma. I, I think that's what I wanted to focus on today to accept that it is a reality, but of course there are different levels of conversation we can have about it and even vocabulary. But at the end of the day, it is still the same thing. Yeah. Yeah. One in five of us in our workplaces is experiencing a diagnosable mental illness. One in five, right? If you have a team of five, that means chances are at least one person in your team has a diagnosable mental illness. That to me is huge. A second one is that over 40% of us have symptoms of anxiety or depressive disorder. I was talking about that burnout chart earlier. The reason why I even created it was because there was so much anxiety that I was noticing my clients were holding. And then the third statistic is that there are over 53% of us who say that our workplaces are negatively impacting our mental health. So something that's happening in our culture of the organization, the way the boss might be managing us, 53% of us are experiencing negative impacts due to our workplaces. Wow, that's uh, actually more normality than an exception. But to switch the conversation now more in like actions that one can do by listening to us today. So where do we start to even see like, Am I all right? Am I not all right? You know, I, like I said, I was not even aware that there were things happening because I didn't have the tools actually to even identify, scan my body, understand what was going on. I just normalized it. It's like, it's part of a job, nothing to signal, right? So how do we start Mm -hmm. to check with ourselves first? I certainly have suggestions and I'll preface that also by saying it's such an immense topic that it's really easy to feel overwhelmed by this. So if Mm -hmm. we even start to look at 
you know, how might my behaviors be impacting other people and where did those behaviors come from? It's opening up this huge exploration. So I want to start first by saying that no one has to do anything, Mm -hmm. which might be counterintuitive, but it's really important to say that no one has to do anything because this is something that we will be ready when we're ready. So we'll have the realizations, just like you shared on your journey, you had the realization that something bigger was happening when you had that realization. And it probably couldn't have been forced on you any earlier or later. Mm. So I think that's the first thing is just take away this pressure that we have to do something, that this is super urgent. But I want to speak about the role of the organization and the leaders, which is that organizations and leaders don't have to do anything. However, we're seeing, and I think some of these statistics are showing, that we're going to reach a point where we can't ignore this any longer. And the role of the organization then would be to find a healthy way to balance these conversations without overstepping into the realm of therapy. Coaching isn't therapy, but it is therapeutic. The same thing can be applied in the organization where the interventions that we may make in the future don't need to be therapy, but it's pretty much guaranteed that just by having the intervention, it will be therapeutic. So it will have an effect on people in the organization. And so let's get into some of the specificity. Let's say for the leader themselves, one is the willingness to look in the mirror, really look at yourself in the mirror and see yourself clearly. So not seeing who you think you should be or who society has told you you are, but looking in the mirror and seeing like, what are my flaws? How am I behaving? What impact is that having on the people around me? Who am I really? What are my desires? What brings me energy? So it's that willingness and then the openness to change that may follow that. When it comes to the individual and those around them, I would say that the next step is then to practice holding a broad permission field. So just like that permission of, hey, you can talk about anything. You can be anyone in this space, but this needs to be applied both for self and others. So being both forgiving of ourselves, let's say I had an emotional outburst. I got angry and I yelled. I know that that's wrong. I know I don't want to do it again. But the first step is to say, I forgive you. I forgive you as yourself for having done that. It's okay you did that. Let's do better next time. So it's that permission field of forgiveness and the same for others. So let's say someone in your team deeply offends you. Let's say they say something racist and horrific. They really should have never said. The first step is to allow that to have happened. That, hey, everyone makes mistakes. That hurt me, but it happened. And it's welcome. So it's possible to hold both permission and boundary. So as I said, with the anger example, let's say I got really angry and I yelled at someone and then I felt I contracted and I felt a lot of shame afterwards. One is allowing the permission that I made a mistake that happened. And then the second one is holding the boundary for myself of I'm not going to let that happen again. You know, I'm not going to do that. I'm going to find another way to work with my anger, another way to relieve this pressure that's building up inside of me that happened to be directed at that poor other person in that particular incident. And there are ways to do that. So there are ways to help us release pressure. I mentioned a few simple ones earlier, getting eight hours of sleep, (laughs) doing (laughs) things that we enjoy. It sounds really basic, but these are the things that relieve stress. I'm going to bring in another point, actually. I know we left the burnout topic, but I want to say that the road to burnout is actually due to trauma. We don't say to ourselves, oh man, if I overwork myself and become super stressed and so anxious that my eyesight goes bad, (laughs) then, (laughs) then I'm going to be happy, right? We don't set that out as what happiness looks like. And yet somehow so many of us end up there. We're feeling anxiety. We're not able to see or think clearly. We're working really long hours. And we're doing that because of some trauma response. And again, it's different for all of us, but it's really clear that doesn't happen because we're healthy, happy, boundaried, and balanced. Right. The last piece with how you start 
I already said the other two parts around how you look at yourself, around how you can hold a broad permission field for yourself and others. And maybe just the last piece would be knowing when you need support and then reaching out for that. And it can be super simple. It can look like just reaching out to a friend. It doesn't need to be a whole thing of navigating some insurance system and finding a therapist. (laughs) It doesn't need to be that. It can be just as simple as reaching out to a friend or something as small as that. I really appreciated your answer to this is like, There's nothing to do. And it's a good reminder for me as well to give time to time. Definitely in my own journey, I can recognize that for a long time, I didn't realize that asking for help was coming from a pattern and a much deeper place, a place of pain that was limiting me to grow. And I think here I was fortunate to be surrounded by a very close circle of friends in Berlin. We have that great uh, group of girlfriends, actually, not necessarily in gaming, but very independent, thoughtful, and also talking quite openly about therapy. And that normalized it more for me. If I was hearing it from strangers, I would judge them from this lens, like, oh, okay, they have problems, so they are going to therapy. But there were my friends and I could respect them a lot for many of the qualities. And then they shared that they had before therapy or that's what made them get here. And that made me realize there's something that I misjudged. And the only way for me to have my own judgment that is a bit more objective is to experience it myself. And then this is where by the conversation and curiosity, I understood there was much more and I had the tools to, again, understand even the nature of how the brain and our whole personality develops, that it has origin much further than what we can remember. And it was a knowledge I didn't have, actually. And also the importance of using the body as a signal and the compass for your emotions, like reading your emotion. We have a bit of this practice in yoga. And before, when I was doing yoga, I was like, what is that? Is this a hoo-hoo thing where, you know, like you scan your body? What's the point of it? But by reading a bit more by about the connection of body, mind, psychology, I understood how you can read your body as a tool and then use your emotions as a compass. And so now I feel more integrated and more home to see things with more nuances. And when I see people behaving not so well towards me, having this understanding, and this is where it's helpful as a leader, I see the pain of a person and then I have empathy and I can have a conversation from a point of view of inquiry and curiosity. So then we get really to the real conversation of what it is about. The real conversation is, I don't know, sometimes I just didn't feel appreciated. So you don't feel loved enough. Where has it been missing? Or I have a fear of something terrible that will happen that will threaten my position. Oh, okay. This is about this. Then Let's solve this. Let's solve really the root of the conversation. People feel this as a mystical like way of approaching things, but there's nothing mystical about it. It was just learning more, understanding how humans work. What it means to be human 101, right? These <laughs> yeah. are things, experiences that we have that none of us can escape from. None of us can escape from the experience of having trauma, at least little t trauma. None of us can escape from the experience of feeling misunderstood or having misunderstandings with other people. These are all very human things. And speaking of when you're talking about this conflict with others, I just want to really reemphasize that point you made that what we think the conflict is, is usually not what the conflict is. It's just the words on the surface. And we find that what's beneath that, it's always related to something deeper, either a need we have that wasn't met or a value we have that was violated or misaligned or simply a patterning in our trauma that's playing out and meeting the patterning in someone else's trauma that's playing out. And what I'll often see in these conflicts is that each person will talk at each other and they're saying the thing that they think the conflict is about, but they're ta- they're having two entirely different conversations. Mm. And so part of that journey or experience is guiding them into the place of being able to speak from what's happening beneath what they think is happening. And again, that's always some inward experience. Like I said, a need or a value or some trauma that's being reenacted and played out in real time. Yeah. 
as we have touched a lot about the definition examples, and I think here I wanted to summarize a bit the conversation that we've had today, because we are very familiar with what we discussed today, but I can recognize that it might be very foreign, new and weird, maybe for some people who are listening to this for the first time. So I wanted to summarize some takeaway from our conversation. And I think the most powerful one was by listening to this, there's nothing to do. It will come. You are curious, you're ready or whatever. Because you will know when you need to go a bit beyond of what you know today. So I think it's a very useful one to relieve the pressure we put on ourselves to be better, stronger, or trying to fix something now. It's actually making things worse in this tension, pressure, stress that we create. And the second for me from our conversation is really about self-acceptance and forgiveness, So there are probably things that we know deeply, but we don't want to look at and maybe somewhere a feeling of shame. But yeah, like you said, like forgiving yourself, a part of you, the past mistakes. And I'm reading this day, The Myth of Normal from Gabor Maté that you mentioned, and accepting more or abnormality as a normality because no one's perfect. <laughs> It's like, get out of this myth. And we have many things that have influenced the way we are and That's why we are having this conversation today where from outside you, you can look like, okay, everything is under control, but the reality, and maybe that's what we should talk more about, is it's a lot of work to get there because we have accepted darker part of more shadow part of ourselves through this journey. I think another takeaway would be that you don't need to be a trained therapist to understand how trauma might be impacting you, your teams, and your organizations. I think that we've been for too long holding that as separate. Like, well, that's therapy. It stays outside of the workplace. And hopefully it's become clear that those lines, we can't help it. They are blurring. And we can either choose to be educated and equipped to just be ready, or we can continue pretending like it's not happening and repressing it and mm -hmm. then not being ready when it is standing right in front of us. Yeah, a very good reminder. And I think it makes it more accessible to be open to get a bit more knowledge about it or even recognize it. Yeah, I had mentioned these archetypes earlier and I know we didn't talk about them today, but I wanted to say that I'm creating them in conjunction with a colleague of mine named Nora Dietrich and she's a mental health advocate and she's also a psychotherapist by profession, but now she works on mental health in organizations. And so she and I are creating this set of archetypes to start conversations, to maybe bring a little bit more awareness. I'm going to give you the link for the download, Sophie, so that people can go who are listening and download it if they do want to dive into it a little bit deeper. That's great. And that's great materials. Thanks for mentioning it. And I'll make sure to put the link in the show notes. And I look forward as well to diving into it. You know that I love this kind of material. So thanks a lot for sharing those. But for today, thanks a lot for your time and this deep conversation. And I look forward to your future conversation that will be, of course, of a record for own coaching. But today, thanks a lot for sharing as well your insight as a coach and as yourself. Yeah, thank you as well. Thanks for listening to this latest episode of the Rise and Play podcast. I am trying to grow a community of conscious leaders across the industry and beyond. So if you want to join this movement, please share the podcast with other conscious leaders because we have so much more we can learn from each other. Also, please don't forget to follow the show so you don't miss out on future content. Every episode is packed with actionable insights that will help you improve your leadership skills now. And if you are interested in learning more on the topics that we discussed today, you can find more insights on riseandplay.io and there you will also find my free masterclass on conscious leadership. So have a great week and until the next time.